In today's show, we're going to talk more about how fasting and meal timing impact your brain chemistry, namely the neurotransmitters serotonin and dopamine that are intimately involved in regulating your food-seeking behavior, overall appetite, overall how much energy you consume, and satiety and quelling those food cravings. This group out of Amsterdam have published a series of amazing studies that are all related to changes in brain chemistry as it is related to fasting, meal timing, and changes in obese individuals compared to lean individuals. So it's been long known that the brain is involved in food-seeking behavior and uh, regulating overall energy intake, and there is some sort of hypothalamic resistance to leptin, a key uh, sort of systemic uh, dipocytokine, uh, so it's it's both a hormone and, and a cytokine that is involved in food-seeking behavior, but also serotonin and dopamine are intimately involved, and there may be crosstalk also with insulin. So today we're going to simplify this and understand some of the details and the practical takeaways. I don't want to share with you a bunch of complex jargon, but I want to unpack this research and help you better understand the significance of this and how to better improve and get more results from your fasting, whether you do a 16-8 or you eat one meal a day or you periodically fast for 24 hours or more, I want you to understand this research paper that found that obese individuals after they fast for 24 hours did not have the same increase in a key neurotransmitter regulating food-seeking behavior and energy intake called serotonin in the hypothalamus compared to lean individuals. Now, what they found is that there was a significant correlation between the drop in insulin after fasting and the increase in free fatty acids after fasting and that link with an increase in serotonin signaling within the brain, uh, particularly in lean individuals. So it turns out that obese individuals, they don't have the same fasting-induced reduction in insulin and the fasting-induced increase in free fatty acids. So the take-home here, in my estimation, is not that obese people are broken. It's not that obese people have you know, bad brains or anything. It's that maybe obese people, in addition to fasting, would also benefit from, guess what? Cutting out their calories in processed foods and hyperpalatable foods, industrial seed oils and sugars and all of that, but also improve their sleep and their exercise. So that's where we're going to go and we're going to talk about the details and the nuances. I want to welcome you back. It's Mike Mutzel. As always, I'm grateful that you're here. If you enjoy this video, you can leave a comment below. That really helps the YouTube algorithm. You can hit that like button and let YouTube know that you thought this was helpful. If you're in iTunes and you're listening, please share this with a friend that might resonate with this video only if you think that this is very helpful. And I do want to let you know that our sister company, Myoscience, just recently updated a very popular sleep and stress reduction formula that is also a electrolyte. So we added in glycine and potassium to the very popular My Relax and Calm. I would like you to check that out if you want to optimize your sleep and get electrolytes and cover your bases. It has magnesium, taurine, L-theanine, GABA, um, inositol. Now it also has glycine as well as potassium. So this is a wonderful formula, very well priced. It tastes phenomenal. It is stevia free, sweetened with monk fruit. It's an awesome blend and it absolutely works. So you can use a coupon code podcast at checkout. I will link that below. Also, we did a podcast with Dr. Ben Lynch. So today we're going to talk a lot about serotonin, dopamine, and all these different neurotransmitter profiles. If you want an update on some of those uh, neurotransmitters and a way to assess your own neurotransmitter susceptibilities and tendencies, please check out that episode where we talked about that. So let's continue on. The title of the paper, and it was published in the Journal of Metabolism, The Response to Prolonged Fasting and Hypothalamic Serotonin Transporter Availability is Blunted in Obesity. I know that's a lot of a lot of jargon there. Um, so again, what these scientists did, and they had two different research arms of the study. They had an overweight arm, and they had a lean arm, and they fasted these subjects for twelve hours, then did some spec scan uh, studies. So you may have heard of Daniel Amen. So he's been talking and a lot about the spec scan, and it's a type of neuroimaging that allows you to figure out specific brain regions which are being triggered or activated, others that aren't, and you can also make correlation correlations and inferences um, based upon these imaging studies to figure out which neurotransmitters are changing and they did additional analysis. So in the first study of its kind, scientists in Amsterdam discovered how fasting changes brain levels of key appetite controlling neurotransmitters, serotonin and dopamine in lean individuals, but not in obese subjects. Previous studies have demonstrated that the hypothalamus and thalamus regions of the brain are essential in regulating appetite and meal intake. Really important to understand this because we're going to talk about meal timing shortly. Serotonin, in particular, it appears, plays a significant role in governing satiety by acting as an appetite suppressant. Lower levels of it are found in insulin-resistant obese subjects compared to lean controls. 
So again, serotonin is intimately involved in governing the quantity of foods that you eat and, and maybe the types of calories that you eat. Now, you might want to think about this. Um, if you've ever felt really depressed or tired or you've had a very stressful event in your life and you've been burning through serotonin or maybe you stayed up all night or something like that, what are the foods that you tend to crave during those situations? I guarantee you it's not uh, uh, eggs and avocado. It's probably processed, hyperpalatable, high caloric, high sugar, easy to, to uh, overconsume foods. So keep that in mind. So um, neurotransmitters are intimately involved here, as are systemic cytokines and, and dipocytokines like leptin. And you may have heard about leptin resistance. Well, the region in the brain where serotonin plays an important role in governing and regulating food-seeking behavior, appetite, satiety, and the quantity of energy that you consume is called the hypothalamus. Now, it turns out that leptin also signals here, and there may be some sort of crosstalk and correlation between systemic leptin levels and also serotonin. So what these researchers found is after a 24-hour fast, the scientists discovered via SPECT scans, where I talk about it's capital S-P-E-C-T, it's a SPECT imaging. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, this is pretty non-invasive. And they found a significant increase in serotonin signaling in the hypothalamus in lean subjects, but not in obese subjects. Now, this is important because it may be that obese individuals may also need to include exercise, and may need to work on sleep, stress reduction, and fine-tune their diet uh, to improve the metabolic flexibility because what the scientists actually suspect is that insulin resistance and metabolic inflexibility, commonly present in obese individuals, may have contributed to the lack of fasting-related increases in this key neurotransmitter, i.e. serotonin. Uh, they think this may be due to fasting-related changes in insulin and free fatty acids. So there was a correlation after doing what's called a regression analysis uh, they f they show that changes in these neurohormones or these these um, the the two hormones that I mentioned, uh, insulin and also the free fatty acids, accounted for a significant amount of the increases in serotonin in the brain of the lean subjects. So let's just pause there. I think that's important to sort of recognize is that it turns out that the whole body is interconnected. Who would have ever knew, right? So when you're chain when you have when you undergo a fast and your your insulin drops your glucagon increases, um, you know, your glucose goes down, guess what that hormonal recipe creates? That creates enhanced lipolysis that we talked about last week, that skeletal muscle, when you resist, you know, you do resistance training, there's this little extracellular vesicle that releases, remember we talked about that uh, microRNA, and that's able to epigenetically target your fat cells to release more fat. The fat that they're releasing is known as free fatty acids. So um, fat is stored as triglycerides or triglycerols, uh, triacylglycerides. And these triglycerides, when they're split up via this process of lipolysis, those free fatty acids go around. Now, it turns out that overweight individuals have sort of this imbalance and this reduced ability to undergo this, this sort of hormone-sensitive lipase and these different changes um, uh, and lipoprotein, lipase, and all of this uh, when it comes to fasting-induced increases in the release of stored energy. So it may be that the changes in the brain chemistry upon fasting are actually due to a blunted uh, in, uh, insulin reduction upon fasting. So by improving the metabolic flexibility by way of exercise and all the ancillary things uh, from a low-carb ketogenic style diet, improving sleep and sleep disorder breathing and all the other stuff, in addition to fasting, might accelerate some of the benefits of fasting. And I keep underscoring this because I see so many comments. I've worked with clients who have been doing just one thing. What? Oh yeah, I'm eating low carb, or oh, I'm only exercising, but I, but I eat crappy food and I don't fast, or I only fast. And I'm trying to get people to see the big picture that they need to do a little bit of everything. And and when you start to go uh, approach this from my multi pronged approach, you don't have to be super extreme in any one of those things because you have some buffering capacity. So if you exercise, you don't maybe have to cut out your calories as much or reduce your carbs as much. And if you also compress your feeding window, you have so much buffer room and you're hitting this from different angles, which I think is, is really important to understand. So it's plausible that obese individuals were affected by reduced metabolic flexibility and thus a blunted fasting-induced reduction in insulin and rise in free fatty acids upon fasting. So what was interesting about 
this paper, and I'll share this on the screen right now, is there was a very significant change in fasting-related insulin levels in the lean group compared to the obese individuals. And again, using this regression analysis, this research team was able to find that this accounted for a very significant amount of the fasting increase in brain serotonin levels in the lean subjects, but not the obese subjects. So um, perhaps more consistent fasting paired with exercise and nutritional changes aimed at improving metabolic flexibility could improve fasting-related shifts in these neurotransmitters that regulate appetite and satiety. Now, it's important to recognize that this research team has found over the years of their course of study, particularly study of the brain as it relates to appetite control and satiety, that fasting is not the only thing that impacts appetite regulatory uh, neurotransmitters and messages messengers. Prior study found that when obese men consume 50% of their daily calories at breakfast, dopamine and serotonin were increased significantly. And this was throughout the day compared to when they consumed that same amount of energy at dinner. And so what they found is that when they consumed, uh, you know, a lot of their energy right at dinner, there was actually a decrease in dopamine and decrease in serotonin. And you can imagine where this could cause some challenges when it comes to weight regain and sustaining weight loss because dopamine, if you don't have enough dopamine or serotonin uh, signaling, what are you going to do? You're going to crave alcohol. You're going to crave hyperpalatable processed sugar enriched foods, ice cream, cookies, crackers, treats, and so forth. You might even not get that same appetite satiety related signal uh, because of the reduction in dopamine. So you all know my biases. I'm a huge fan of time, early time-restricted feeding. Eat early, sleep early. If there's one thing you take away from this video and pair that with exercise, that is the message here. So I know we're talking about a lot of complex jargon about chemistry and all that, but, but just remember that early time-restricted feeding has been shown to be very important, very effective. Uh, many elite athletes and people that have lean bodies year round, they stop their la they stop their feeding window, they cut it off around four to six PM, right? So they're having they're eating earlier in the day, they're stopping and eating uh, you know, uh, starting their fast um, earlier in the late afternoon, early evening. So what can we take away from these findings? Well, we've already sort of talked about the butt, but if you're seeking to improve your body composition uh, and struggle with food cravings, or you're trying to eat more of your um, you know, energy and so forth, uh, you know, figure out what you're trying. And if you're trying to figure out which fasting window is best for you, you might want to consider early time-restricted feeding. And if you're not getting the benefits from fasting that you seek to get, you may want to include exercise as part of that modality. And that might even include exercise to kick off your fast because we know that exercise is a great way to sort of accelerate the hormonal shifts that are that are needed to get into the state of ketosis, which unfortunately uh, this research team did not actually look at uh, ketones. It would be interesting, but there is this inverse relationship between uh, insulin and ketones. So presumably if the insulin was high and significantly higher in the obese individuals compared to the lean group, that that might be partly to, to, to blame uh, in terms of its causation and change in the serotonin levels upon fasting. So anyway, I think it's a really interesting study and series of studies. And what I will do in the show notes is include some related articles, um, you know, from this research team that again, show that fasting affects serotonin and dopamine different in the brains of lean subjects compared to overweight subjects. And I think it's just, there's more to the story here. And I, I do just want to mention, because I know a lot of you listen to this as you're doing other things, the study that I was referring to in 2017 with regards to eating more energy in the morning compared to in the evening is titled, uh, timing of calorie intake during weight loss differentially affects striatal dopamine transmitter and thalamic serotonin transmitter binding. And that was in 2017. So I'll put that in the show notes. So again, some key takeaways, some things to take away from this is serotonin plays an important role in appetite, uh, control, satiety, food seeking behavior. Uh, and it's been shown that individuals, if they have a greater reduction in insulin and, and a greater increase in free fatty acids after fasting, that they have a greater increase in serotonin upon fasting. So uh, this, this plays an important role. Uh, eating earlier in the day may support higher levels of serotonin and dopamine uh, and thus may impact food seeking behavior and appetite control throughout the day. So again, if you're struggling with food cravings, if you're like, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm really hungry. I want a cookie or I want a, uh, you know ice cream or a snack after dinner, maybe trying 
to push your the bulk of your energy to earlier in the day. That doesn't mean you wake up and go right to the refrigerator and start crushing food. That means you know you wait till you get a little bit of those you know those gurgling, those hunger signals and cues from your GI tract. That might mean that you have you know a meal before noon and then you have your dinner maybe four o'clock, five o'clock, something a little bit earlier as opposed to pushing it out later. Uh, and then lastly, you know, this is just my inference here is that obese or overweight individuals may need to also pair exercise with their fasting to enhance or optimize the results. Again, because exercise accelerates the necessary hormone signature to cause your fat cells and your liver uh, to start releasing fat and then oxidizing that by way of beta oxidation. So um, you know, we got, we got to look at this from multiple angles, right? It's not just one thing. We can't just fast or we can't just cut out the carbohydrates and the, and, and, and energy and reduce energy. We got to do all these different things. And, and again, it gives you more buffer capacity, more, more leeway, um, to have, you know, some of the foods that you might enjoy, maybe a little extra, you know, treat here or there, uh, without sort of derailing your progress. So hopefully you found this helpful. Hopefully you find the show notes and some of the images that we've been sharing on this video helpful. Uh, if you do, as always, you you can hit that like button, share this with a friend or family member. You can tag this and share this over on Instagram. I'm metabolic underscore Mike. And I look forward to hearing from you in the comments and we will see you on a future podcast down the road. It's great that you were here and thanks for tuning all the way in. Catch you all soon. Bye now.